What's up, guys? You know, it's it's really amazing when I think about Atlantis and everything that you have heard about Atlantis in your life, the Lemurians and the energy crystals and advanced technologies and all of this. And what's interesting about that is that all of that came from one person, Plato, mentioning it in a book a thousand years ago. And he didn't describe anything like that. You know, he gave a physical description. He talked about their planes and their fields and all this. He wasn't talking anything about all the energy crystals. But we've all heard it. <laughs> and I believe the only other direct source was Edgar Casey, who was doing this in his sleep uh, through a medium. But Casey just described what would be considered a modern Hellenistic period city on an island in concentric circles that match, you know, the location and everything matches perfectly with the eyes, the Sahara. But I just wanted to illustrate how the story of Atlantis with its simple, humble beginnings turned into this whole big thing. And I see that happen with a lot of subjects on YouTube. I also find it interesting that while everybody has heard of Atlantis, hardly anybody has heard of this and is from the same book. While everybody's attention is on the city of Atlantis itself, they don't listen to the full story of what the story of Atlantis is, and it's saying that there are cyclical catastrophes. And the Egyptian priest that is talking here says that you guys did not keep imperishable records. We carved this stuff into stone. The original writing of this is worded more along the lines of the appointed time instead of after a period of time because after a period of time does kind of insinuate that it is a fixed cycle and that may not necessarily be the case although when i get back around to the inca i'll talk about their 800 year great conjunction cycle that they pretty much say 800 years is the it in the first paragraph, he mentioned earth fire here. Inundations visit like a pestilence and leaves only those of you destitute of letters and education. And he says that the genealogies, the histories that the Hellenes had at that time were like tales of children. They only remember one flood. And the people that came before you were the fairest and noblest race of men that ever lived. And you are but a seed or remnant. Now, I would literally take this to be giant human beings, you know, 12 to 18 feet tall, because the remains of these people have been found. Even Lincoln in his inaugural address uh, mentioned the ancient race of giants that used to live in this country. Now, let me ask you something. It is well known that the ancients highly revered their dead. I mean, one of the seven wonders of the ancient world was the mausoleum at Herculaneum. People built great, big, impressive mausoleums to honor their dead. Where are all of those today? I'll just tell you, I study the crap out of archaeology. Uh, occasionally, there are some of these mausoleums found, but something has happened to all of them. Anyway, that's the real story of Atlantis that Plato is describing is that there are cyclical catastrophes, yet somehow everybody's just worried about the city of Atlantis. So on this channel, I'm not really going to try to get too caught up in the energy crystals. I'm going to go with the facts here. And the fact is, all of the ancient cultures spoke of these catastrophes that our modern scientists would say are impossible. So let's look at the Oralinda book and uh, story of the Danish people, basically. And the first few pages of this are talking about the authenticity of it because obviously academia says that this is a work of fiction, but the doctor that came across this manuscript that was a family heirloom that, you know, the guy was actually, he wasn't trying to make it public. It's just that he happened to hear about it and was able to study it. And he gives a whole history of, you know, the type of paper, the ink being used and all this. And it's it's a convincing 
description that he gives. And based on my own research, if this really was written a hundred years basically before the events of the 14th century, then it was definitely written by someone knowledgeable about what happens during these events because they're all described in the same ways. And as far as the catastrophe goes, that's only one aspect of this book. Um, it's customs and laws and all of this stuff. And it's also an account of a culture that had to leave their homeland and find other places to live, which created problems because of the other people living there. Uh, it goes into how the priest class has basically ruled everybody for a very long time. But the Fries, the Frieslanders, uh, they weren't about that, the followers of Freya. We're going to jump straight to the chapter called How the Bad Time Came. During the whole summer, the sun had been hid behind the clouds as if unwilling to look upon the earth. There was perpetual calm, and the damp mist hung like a wet cell over the houses and the marshes. The air was heavy and oppressive, and in men's hearts was neither joy nor cheerfulness. In the midst of this stillness, the earth began to tremble as if she was dying. The mountains opened to vomit forth fire and flames. Some sank into the bosom of the earth, and in other places mountains rose out of the plain. Old land, called by the seafaring people at land, disappeared, and the wild waves rose so high over hill and dell that everything was buried in the sea. Many people were swallowed up by the earth, and others who had escaped the fire perished in the water. During three years, this continued, but at length it ceased, and forests became visible. Many countries were submerged, and in other places land rose above the sea, and the wood was destroyed through half of Germany. And then they go on to say that the troops who stuck together were okay, but the people that were dispersed by it were exterminated or made slaves, so they learned to stick together. Now, where we're talking about here, they refer to it as Jutland, uh, modern-day Denmark, the peninsula that sticks up to the north there. Though the names are similar between Atlan and Atlantis, I don't think there's any relation. I don't think it's a retelling of the story. This is a history of the Frieslanders. And without getting into the problems of the timeline, this would be 2000 BC as to where Plato's Atlantis would have been thousands of years before that. But the author also mentions the Cimbrian Flood, which is about 100 BC during Roman times. We'll get into that a little bit later. So let's just picture this. All of a sudden you wake up one morning and everything is hazy. The sun isn't giving forth its light very well. And I've heard it hypothesized this could be uh, associated with the Hopi Blue Kachina because the red light rays, infrared rays and everything are getting blocked by either volcanic ash or impact debris, and all you're getting is the blue light waves through. So the sun stops shining, and the wind stops blowing, and when I get to the 14th century, you're going to hear the exact same thing from China and Europe and the Incas in America, though I think the order of events vary, and that's where I'm really trying to sleuth things out right now. But there's no sun, there's no wind, Everything's quiet, and then the screaming begins. I mean, it just breaks off into earthquakes. In the way they describe the mountains open to vomit forth fire and flames, uh, you know, a dormant volcano springing to life, a new one forming, I don't know, because in other places, mountains rose out of the plain. Now, that may sa sound fantastical, and modern science will say it's absolutely impossible, but this is described over and over again. In some places, the mountain rose up. In other places, the earth opened up or caved in and people along with it. Again, accounts of the 14th century of this happening in France. And with that much land displacement, if you live anywhere near the sea, then you are bound to get hit by a tsunami. And you would definitely think after all this that you've incurred the wrath of the gods. And this wasn't just a quick hit and over. This went on for three years. Now, it probably wasn't nonstop, but you probably didn't get much peace at that time. Take, for example, the New Madrid earthquakes of 1812. 
those went on for like 11 months and they varied in intense in intensity um then a big one came of like seven and then about a month later was the really big one like an eight people literally thought it was the end of the world whole bluffs fell off into the mississippi river it ran backwards real foot lake was formed in a very short time frame and you had sand boils where sand would just liquefy up out of the ground and i honestly think that what happened in new madrid 1812 was mild in comparison to some of the events that have happened further back in the past and if that's not enough to keep you up at night the whole damn country sitting downwind of you is on fire and just blowing ash over on you the book also says that this stands inscribed upon all citadels so i also want to point out that these are what the romans would describe as barbarians but they did have a writing system in 2000 bc and inscribed on the citadels was before the bad time came our country was the most beautiful in the world the sun rose higher and there was seldom frost these are the people of the jutland peninsula just south of norway and here i'm showing you guys a tropical forest found under arctic norway now let's see how old how old is this according to the quackadamics oh yeah that's you know 380 million years old give or take a few million oh yeah well you guys just found out about this six years ago and here I'm reading a book that was translated from another language back in 1848. And he's describing that it was once a more tropical land up in that area and the sun rose higher. Hell, it seldom even frost. The trees and shrubs produce various fruits which are now lost. Now, if you ask me, we're talking about a major impact event here. I mean... Grand Solar Minimum, which I think is misunderstood because there's always a comet or something involved with that. But I don't think just increased earthquakes and volcanoes are going to account for the sun changing position. And, and we've got all kinds of evidence of this. You know, the, the woolly mammoths, well, they find those up in Siberia. With eating buttercups, I mean, tropical flowers. This also makes me think of uh, Geocosmic Rex, uh, Randall Carlson and Graham H Hancock and their Younger Dryas Hiawatha Crater theory. Here's Hiawatha Crater up on the top left, and then there's Denmark down on the top right. So if there was a major impact event there, Yes, I would totally expect to see all these things happening where they were described. Could we be actually reading a first-hand account of that event taking place? Well, this guy back in 1848 didn't have access to all this information that we do. So I find it highly unlikely that he just pulled this out of thin air. And this wasn't just a localized event. It affected people for thousands of miles. It says when Atlan was submerged, there was much suffering also on the shores of the Mediterranean. So possibly around the same time as the sinking of Heraklion. I'm going to end right here. Uh, I definitely want to get back to this book in the future. There's more interesting things to learn from it. But I thought I'd end with showing a list of floods from a different source. Here's a list of major flooding dating all the way back to what they have as 516 AD, a great storm flood by which the whole of Friesland was covered with water and 6,000 men were drowned. And it goes on and on. I, I do want to point out that 536 AD is, according to historians, the worst year ever to be alive because of all of the catastrophes that happened right there that are described exactly the same as in this book as in the 14th century. Now this looks like and is a lot, but take for instance, 1860 to 1015, that's uh, 150 years without anything happening. So that would be just like us today trying to relate with the events of the New Madrid earthquake back in 1812, a very long time ago, many generations in between. 
but there are definitely periods where the intensity and frequency picks up. This is four pages of flooding that I'm just blowing through here. Each one of them just as devastating as the last one. And I find interesting the 1791 through 1794 destructive floods with southwest winds, this and that. That is about 10 years after the 1780 Lockheed Iceland volcanic eruption that, I mean, it ultimately led to the French Revolution, you know, starvation and stuff. Let them eat bread or let them eat cake, rather. Uh, and then also several years after the 1816 year without summer, 1815 Mount Tambora eruption, then they had another spell of five years of inclement weather. So it seems to me after thousands of years of flooding and things like this that, yeah, you would come up with photographs like this. But looking at random photographs with no context, I, I just don't see how you're actually going to learn anything from that. It's great for chat room speculation, uh, but just like my example at the beginning of the video with the simple, humble origins of the city of Atlantis, it's real easy for the rumor mill to get going and turn a little bit of truth into Lemurian power crystals. <laughs> and if that's what you're into, that's cool. Um, it's just I don't think it reflects reality very well. See you guys on the next one. Laters.